thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, the, the research that I am, have been working on briefly, um, I, I actually learned about it reading on Yahoo News. And what I found is that snake bite is actually a really serious problem, but primarily in developing countries. In fact, the World Health Organization suggests that it could be as many as 1.8 million envenomations every year. And what I have shown here on this computer screen, if you can see it, is the, a photograph of a, um, a child who was bitten by a snake, and his leg is, what you're seeing there, is completely destroyed after after having been bitten by a Bothrop snake. And uh, so this is a very serious problem. He survived. He was one of the lucky ones. Now we have snake antivenoms that are available, but they're made from horse serum. So they basically inject a horse with the venom and not effective, it's very expensive, and people get sick from it, and as you can well imagine, they already don't feel well because they've been bitten by a snake. So we are trying to develop a peptide antidote that was actually developed by an Indian woman who came to this country, and she patented this peptide that she found from the opossum. It's a, a protein that she found in the opossum serum, and she discovered that a small peptide fraction of this large protein has the activity. So we didn't really believe this could be true, but we purchased the peptide. We just had it chemically synthesized by a company, and we tested it in, with, in mice using rattlesnake venom. And there was just a remarkable effect. The mice that received the venom only died within 12 hours, and the mice that received the venom, the same amount of venom, but incubated with the peptide, showed no effects. They, they never showed any effects of these envenomations. So they were, the, the, basically the venom was completely neutralized. So this woman, her research was completely off the radar screen for many years, and her patent has expired, I'm, and I'm giving you all the secrets, but the idea here is that we really need to solve this problem. So I, if it's not going to be me, I hope somebody out there can help, um, help work on this problem to make snake antivenoms inexpensive and available for the people in developing countries. So um, I thought it would be easier to fish it out of the E. coli broth if it was a larger molecule. So I made a chain of the peptides. I just had a gene sequence, and I made a chain of the peptides expressed. And I um, chose the 11th amino acid because the 11th amino acid is a tryptophan, and you can purchase a commercially available proteinase to cle that cleaves after tryptophan. So the, the strategy for this is to um, make a concatenated chain of peptides expressed in the bacteria and cleave it with a, with a chemical system. So uh, the only inclination that I have comes from a paper that was published last year in Protein and Peptide Letters by a group in India, where they actually took the 10 amino acid peptide and uh, did a molecular dynamic simulation and showed that it actually, with 10 amino acids, it actually has a structure, which is kind of unusual for such a small peptide. Um, and they also showed that it binds relatively tightly with um, two different snake venom toxic proteins, one from cobra and one from the American diamondback rattlesnake. So this is the only evidence that we have of an actual mechanism for this peptide. 
I honestly, most venoms, and I believe also rattlesnake venom, has more than one toxic compound in it. So it's the idea that this peptide simply binds to one of the proteins doesn't seem to answer the problem. But the reality was that in the mice, it answered the problem. And I can't really answer for you why that happened. So, uh, this is a guess, right? Um, but, so industrial enzymes are made for about four, the cost of goods for industrial enzymes is about four cents a gram of enzyme. And I would uh, predict based on the dosage that's required for the mouse, the size of the, the weight of the mouse, that we would need about a gram of this peptide per human. So, uh, in other words, you know, on, a, on, on a really good day, if we get lucky in our process development, we could make this less than a dollar. If we include a uh, chromatography step in there, which with the current process that I'm proposing, we do have a chromatography step or two chromatography steps, it's going to be more on the order of a dollar for a gram, depending on the scale that you produce it at. So if, if we can, I, I, I believe there's a very large volume potential of this. So if you can make it in large volume, you can make it for, for much less money. I saw, a, I saw a paper about it, but I don't think that would have worked with this peptide. But I have seen I, uh, papers about possibly developing vaccines for snake venom. The challenge is that, again, the, the venoms are all different. So the, the function of this peptide and the function of a vaccine would appear to be two completely different things. That's, that's my guess. I'm a chemical engineer, so, you know, this is my best guess. <laughs> Thank you. I doubt the peptide in its native form is going to be that stable, but there are ways of stabilizing it. So this is something that needs to be looked into. So I would have to say this is a long-term project, and we also need to um, do, there, will, there will have to be clinical trials. So it's not it's not a short-term um, idea. Constantly in the team. Yes. Um, this is an excellent idea. If the if those antibodies could be, or if, if those proteins could be produced in the humans in a stable form, then yeah, I think so. I'm not sure how you would do that, but um, yes. Oh, there's a couple of questions in, in there. Um, the, the question about <coughs> the immunogenicity, 
so I, all I can tell you is from our experiments, we injected the peptide alone into the mice and they were completely unaffected by it. So in mice, there's no issue. I can't answer for humans because we haven't done any human trials yet. Um, regarding the multiple snakes, we've, we, we've tested it, the death survival experiment with the rattlesnake, American rattlesnake, and we also um, tested, actually, Elda Sanchez did these experiments at the National Natural Toxin Research Center at the Texas A&M University, Kingsville. She also measured an anti-minimal hemorrhagic dose with the peptide for Russell Viper venom, which is a very aggressive Indian snake that causes a, a severe hemorrhaging, and found that the peptide does have um, activity to neutralize the hemorrhagic effects of that venom. Those are the only tests that we have done so far. So I cannot answer for cobras beyond what's published in the LIPS papers. According to LIPS, works for cobra. But um, sadly, an NIH proposal was rejected because the scientists really don't believe it's going to work in cobras. Even though it does work in rattlesnakes, it seems that they're the small amount of money they wanted to give me, or I was hoping to get from them, depended on all of the snakes being um, effective, effective in all the snakes, with all the snake venom, excuse me. It's nice to dream. I honestly cannot answer that question. As a scientist, I cannot answer that question because I really don't know. Okay, <laughs> I would like it to be the miracle snake antivenom, but it's, I don't know that yet. It's um, the fun. The lip published that it it only needs the first ten amino acids. So the molecular weight of our eleven mer is one thousand two hundred molecules. It's very small. as a me, myself, and I, I'm not. However, there is a rather large snake antivenom research community, and they are. Um, they have found other proteins from the opossum that also can neutralize different snake venoms. Most of it, I've read about vipers. I have not read about cobras. Um, but uh, the meerkat is another one, and your mention of the honey badger. So. These animals have, you know, um, components in their serum that protect them. So, yes. However, the challenge is that when they find the entire protein, to express an entire protein, if, if you want to try to make one of those proteins, if they're actually glycosylated proteins, and one of the researchers in South America showed that the glycosylation is necessary for the full protein to have its activity, so this is a whole other ambit, really, is to have just the, the, um, a small peptide fraction of the whole protein. I don't know if any of the other proteins have that feature, that there could be a peptide that has the activity. In, they've known since the 40s, they, they published since the 40s that the opossum had this, these properties. Um, the, the papers published by uh, Benny Lips were in the early 90s. She patented it in 1996, so the molecules patented. And the, um, so, but the, the interesting thing, and I, I don't really know what to say about it, is that none of her papers were cited by any of the snake antivenom literature, um, including general reviews. So, I mean, I have been looking in a lot of literature to find references to the work that she did, and I haven't found anything. So, it, it breathes that it's not for real. In, I mean, you, you, as I was looking at this, I thought this, this must be, you know, baloney. 
And it wasn't until I said, why don't I try it and see if maybe it works? So I had the peptide synthesized, and it worked with rattlesnakes. Um, so, so far I haven't found any snakes that it doesn't work with. <laughs> so that's where we're at. Um, a year ago in um, May or so, it, over the summer, and then um, then we ran out of peptides. I mean, it's, I'm paying for this with my own money, so I'm actually looking into doing some crowdfunding right now. If you are interested in looking at experiment.com for a project called Low Cost Snake Antivenom, you can feel free to donate at that site. But um, so I've been paying for the activity assays and the lab supplies out of my own um, private sources of money, and so I, I mean, it's happening at a slow pace. 